Four years ago, our general overseer brought a bold vision to the Church of God, a vision to build on the seven core values of the church that the General Assembly had previously adopted with an overwhelming adoption. He came to build healthy, growing, praying ministers as well, who build healthy, growing, praying churches. As a result, the guiding force of his administration has been in the acrostic care, C-A-R-E. C, connectivity. A, affirmation. R, responsibility. E, enrichment. During the past four years, he has traveled to 64 different nations of the world. He has responded to seven major hurricanes. He has led us into a new emphasis on the declaration of faith. He has conducted two district overseers conferences of major influence. He has envisioned and led an emerging leaders conference for our young and emerging leaders. He has sponsored two major conferences on prayer, a national conference on the Holy Spirit, as well as eight regional Holy Spirit conferences highlighting the ministry and gifts of the Holy Spirit in the church. He has envisioned and led new initiatives as it relates to pastoral benefits and educational opportunities for ministers and their families. One of his great passions has been the seven regional Life Builders conferences we had this past spring, where approximately 7,000 men came together, many of them receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He has overseen the completion of our international headquarters building project and has also seen to it that that particular debt has been reduced by about 15%. During this time, American membership has reached 1 million members, with a total of 7 million members around the world. We have averaged planting 174 churches per year each of the four years under his leadership. He has been totally committed to the task and he has worked untiringly to fulfill his vision for the Church of God. In a few moments, I ask you when he comes to stand in honor of the General Overseer and welcome him after this song with an applause of true and genuine appreciation for the giving of himself to the church. Thank you and God bless you. Would somebody just praise the Lord from the depths of your soul tonight? Worship Him, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. While you're standing, let me share with you my scripture tonight. I'm reading from Romans chapter 1, sh chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Paul says to the Roman church in chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. And you may be seated. Hallelujah. I sense God's abiding presence in this place tonight. What wonderful singing we've heard tonight. How the Lord has blessed us in such a special way. How He is here with us in this place to worship and praise His name. I 
want to pause just for a few minutes and think and say thanks to these four men who have served with me as the executive committee and these men who have served with our executive council. Many times in our deliberation, the Holy Spirit has taken over and we've taken time to praise and magnify God during those deliberations. I thank God for these godly men who have been such a strength and such a help to us in these difficult and desperate times. Tonight, as we come to the General Assembly, the 72nd Second General Assembly of the Church of God, we come in critical times. Probably never been a time like today as we assemble in this house. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what tomorrow will bring, but we know who holds tomorrow. And we know he holds our hand. And he will never leave us nor forsake us. As we come into this place, we live in a world and a society that's changing so rapidly. If you travel across the country and around the world, you knew that there are shifts that are taking place in this world like has never been seen in the history of mankind. We see in this world the greatest transfer of wealth in the history of society. We see a change. Something is happening and something is taking place. And I believe that before we ever get back to a general assembly again, maybe there will not be another general assembly. Maybe our next general assembly will be around the throne of God. We are that close, brothers and sisters. I tell you today, if we come back again, it will be a radically changed world. I've traveled across a nation that bragged about its wealth, but now its bridges are crumbling, its society is corrupt, its, its wealth is being transferred somewhere else around the world, and we see a rise of a whole different world out there. It's changing, brothers and sisters. It will not be the same anymore. We are living in rather unique times. The world has never seen. It is in this kind of situation where war looms, where weapons of mass destruction are waiting to be placed in, into orbit to destroy us. It is in this kind of moment that we come and say that if a world ever needed revival, it needs revival now. Oh, God, send a revival. Send a revival. We need a revival today. In this kind of world that we live in, I have said before, and I say again today, a world in crisis deserves a church in revival. I said a world in crisis deserves a church in, uh, deserves a church in revival. This should be our finest hour. It's time to put away our differences. It's time to grab hold of each other's hands. It's time to declare these are the last days. This is our finest hour. There will be no better hour than this because something is about to happen in this world and I'm calling upon the church of God to be used of God in these last days. So when I come to the, to the assignment that I have tonight, it grips me in my heart. We're talking about walking in the Spirit and maintaining our identity. In this day and time, my friend, there are many who pull from one side to another. We're living in a society today that does not want you to have any kind of distinct, distinctive we're living in a society today that political issues are running together. You can't tell one from the other. We're living in a time, my friend, when everything seems to be blending together. There is no black nor white. It is all gray area. It is in that kind of society. It's in that kind of reductionism that's taking place that the world must know that the church of Jesus Christ is still alive and well and will not compromise. Vance Hadner said, if you try to be everything to everybody, you will end up being nothing to anybody. And that's what we have tried to do. The scripture says, do not be forced into the forms of the, of the world. The world would like to identify the church of God. The world would like to say, this is who you are and put a label on us. But they cannot do that because God is constantly moving in this church. He is alive and well. I mentioned to some of you about reading a book in the camp meeting services. I was re relating a, a, from a book that I read. And when they tried to classify these Pentecostals, 
They said this, they are either nothing but or something more. And I thought about that all summer. I have mentioned that. Somebody said, well, they're nothing but a bunch of snake handlers. They're nothing but a bunch of fanatics. They're nothing but a group of people that don't have good sense. There's they're that little church across the railroad track. But we refuse to be identified by any narrow-minded person that has not opened their eyes in the last 50 years to see that God is marching throughout this world with a Holy Ghost revival. I'm here to tell you tonight that we are something more. We are God's chosen people that have been picked up out of nothing and put in the middle of everything and called to declare the glory of God in these last days. Well, I have seen it. I know there are people that would like to say about this church and they would like to say all sorts of things about this church and they would like to complain about this church but God has given this preacher's kid an opportunity to go around this world. I tell you what I've seen. I've seen the greatest sacrifice that people could ever give to the cause of Jesus Christ. This church is full of pastors in faraway places. This church is full of people that are unrecognized here on earth. This church is full of people who have given their life to this cause. This church is full of people who will lay their life on the line any time for this church. And I want to tell the gainsayer, and I want to tell anybody that says anything about the church of God, and I hope they can find it on a video stream somewhere. I have seen it. It is good. It is wonderful. It is joy. It is victory. It is powerful. It's alive. It's active. It's moving. It is the church of God. Hallelujah. And I'm glad to be part of the church of God. I've read every financial report and it's all there. I've been everywhere you can go and they're still worshiping God. I'm here to tell you that the Holy Ghost is not relegated to the back room. I'm here to tell you that God is still alive in this church. Whether it's a tent revival in South Georgia or a Holy Ghost meeting somewhere on a hillside in Romania or in some auditorium, this thing is just about ready to take off with a Holy Ghost revival because God is in the arrangements. Hallelujah. God, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thanks be unto God. You know, when you try to move from one place to another, you always have to have an identity check. One time I was trying to get into Canada, and they asked me where I come from. I said, Texas. Wrong thing to say. One hour and a half later, I come out of an interrogation booth, and they asked me, where do you come from? The United States, ma'am. Well, welcome to our fair country. <laughs> you can't go anywhere today without the identity. You see, we're a, we are a number, uh, we are controlled by bank accounts and excesses is there be the number and we need to know that in this day and time it is easy to lose our way you see Adam and Eve they lost their way they thought they could be wiser than God Cain went into a rage and he lost his way and you know that what happened to him Jacob of old he came to change his identity but you see he could put the, the skins on him and he could smell like a goat but he still sounded like Jacob you cannot hide who you are, brother. The world's got you identified. You can change your name until you run out of paint buckets, but the world knows who you are. We need to know who we are because you see it was Josiah who came to the, the kingdom and they said to Josiah, Josiah, we found something in the bottom of the barrel. And when they looked in the bottom of the barrel, what did they discover? They discovered the Word of God. And when they began to read the Word of God, they realized that they had strayed so far from God. They were so far from Him that they were no longer identified as even re uh, resembling God. Josiah went on his knees and prayed, and God forgave them. I think it's about time we redug our wells and found out who we are and declare to this world, blessed be the Lord God of Elijah. We know who we are and where the Lord has brought us from. For you see, there is a spirit in this age. There is a spirit in this age to accommodate. There is a spirit in this age not to offend. 
sin. There is a spirit in this age that says any old way goes. It reminds me of the church at Laodicea. They said the church at Laodicea, it's neither hot nor cold. At least some people are cold. And God does not like a lukewarm church. He will spew it out of his mouth. Oh God, set us on fire with the power of Pentecost. Set us on fire and ablaze tonight. Let us say we're not lukewarm in this day when we need to be our best, but we're on fire for God. The same thing was said of Ephesus. Ephesus, I tell you this, I know your works, but there's one thing you have done. You have forgot your first love. I want you to repent and do your first works over. I believe one of the most refreshing things could happen in this church of God that we live in is if everybody would put the hatchet away, if everybody would start loving everybody else, if everybody could get bitterness out of the heart, if they could let the Holy Ghost burn with them a new sanctifying power that would make them get up on an altar and sing, makes me love everybody, makes me love everybody. We need a cleansing. We need a bath in the Holy Ghost. We need a change. We need for God to touch our carnality and bring us back to where we should be at the altar of sacrifice and a place of humility. Oh, God, do it for us today. We face an identity crisis. An identity crisis is, is said that this is what it is. It is a period of confusion in which a person's sense of identity becomes insecure, typically due to a change in their expected aims or roles in society. And I ask you tonight, are we facing an identity crisis in the church? I say, whenever, whenever that we have a form of godliness, but we deny the power thereof, we have an identity crisis. I say, when we trade praise for criticism, we've got an identity crisis. I say, when we try to hide the fact that we're Pentecostal, believe in the Holy Ghost, want to take somebody in the back room to pray them through, I say, we've got an identity crisis. I say when we leave the principles of stewardship and try to have a $100 line and a $1,000 line and use some kind of cheap gimmick to get money out of God's people, I say we've got an identity crisis because God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. I tell you, when there is rebellion in the pulpit and rebellion in the pew, we've got a spirit of rich craft that must be taken hold of by the power of the Lord God and bring an identity to us that says we've been cleansed and made whole by the blood of the Lamb. When Holy Ghost revivers are put off and evangelists are sidelined, we have an identity crisis because this is the church of revival. This is a church of the power of God. When we think today that we are turning an organization into a bureaucracy, when there's no movement in the movement, when we just simply have a bunch of form of godliness and a bunch of things going on that doesn't amount to what's happening in this world, we got an identity crisis when we think we can hide behind some kind of an anonymous name and assassinate our brothers. We've got an identity crisis. When ambition takes hold of us and we war with each other, we have an identity crisis. When we're drawn more to bitterness and ambition and power than more than love and fellowship, we've got an identity crisis. But oh, God, cleanse us. Oh, God, touch us one more time with your Holy Ghost. We're ready to march forth like a mighty army. There's a lady sitting here on the front row. She made a special effort to get this to this, camp, this general assembly. She suffers with an incurable disease, but she is an intercessor. She's on the front row intercessing for, to the Lord for me tonight. There are people up around this place that are praying for me. There are prayer towers all over this world where people are praying for me tonight. So I don't care whether you like it. I don't care how you print it in your little book. And I don't care how you criticize. I got one shot to say to this church, blessed be God, we are the people of God. And we're not of this world. We're of another world. God has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. I hope that embarrasses some stiff neck. Hey! 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 
Anybody feel the Holy Ghost in this house? Anybody tire of the devil in this house? Anybody like to slap the devil in this house tonight? She asked me. She said, the Holy Ghost said to me in the nighttime, Oh, you need to answer this question. Who are we? And she said, the Holy Ghost said, What have we become? Are we a political machine? Are we a thriving church? What have we become? And where are we now? Are we toothless? Are we lifeless? Can we not command the devil of hell to take his flight? Because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. She said, what have you done with what you have? Is it time to repent? Our God will remove the candlestick from us. I, for one person, have been repenting and repenting. And I've asked God if I've done anything, if I've done anything in your way, oh God, cleanse me, cleanse me, cleanse me. Because I know something is about to happen in this world. You see, identity is the fact of being who or what a person or thing is. Who are we? And where do we come from? If I were to say to you tonight, and you know, you know the, the biology of the whole matter, when two cells come together and they form a zygote or an embryo, everything about your life is in those two cells that come together. They know when your hair is going to fall out, and no matter how much you spray up there or pad up there, it's still going to go, brother. Even when you're going to get fat and lose your figure, it's all there. So I've been on this search to find out who we are and where we come from. And I've been asking God, oh God, show me. It was revealed to me over a year ago in a little mountain home, the Murphy home over in North Carolina. And I read on that wall the minutes of the First General Assembly of the Church of God. And on that wall of the General Assembly minutes where they're posted there, it says this. It says, strong men wept. That meant the women were weeping and the, men, and the children were weeping, but something caused these hardened mountaineers, these men who braved the elements, something got a hold of them and something touched them and something took place in their life there. It got in our spiritual DNA and it's still there today and it's only when the church of God is willing to weep and to cry for the people of this world that we really are ourselves. You'll never, you'll never escape it. You can't outrun it. You can go to Romania and they can take you to police where a little lady was in a window and when she was gasping for breath, the Holy Spirit moved and she, a gorter fell off of her head and she was healed. And now over a million people in Romania and the diaspora around the world know Jesus Christ. It's in, their, it's in their DNA. You can go to South Africa and you can tell that the DNA of J.F. Rowland who goes in a big auditorium and believes God to fill it up, it's still there. Massive churches are growing in that country. That's in their DNA. You can go to Indonesia and you can see what Jose and duck did with a few men and now over a million members of church of God it's in their DNA there's something about it you walk through northern Mexico you can still see the footprints of Maria Atkinson who left everything and preached under brush harbors it's there it's there you can follow up and down Central America and South America you can look at the boots of J.F. Ingram he put something in their life it's there what do we have today we have 21 people assembled on an old country uh, home over in Murphy North Carolina at the Murphy house and on that night something happened to them something got a hold 
hold of them, weeping a powerful symbol, an awesome rec- a reaction. It began to move upon them, and suddenly they get the passion to do something for God. I'm coming to you tonight at the 72nd General Assembly of the Church of God, and I tell you, I have seen you. I have watched you. You still have that passion. It's still in your DNA. You're here because, because God called you, and it's there. So when we realize that they wept, we know this, that that they were birthed in a passion and they wept. There's something about weeping. The prophets wept when they saw what was about to happen to the world they were living in. Hagar wept when she had a little boy and the thought she drank the last cruise of water. She wept. No, Isaac wept. Joseph wept when he saw his brethren. The children of Israel wept at the death of Moses. Naomi wept when her family was gone. Hannah wept, give me a child. Nehemiah wept when he saw the bad conditions of the wall of Jerusalem. Job wept and Jesus wept. And the church of God weeps today because there's a world going to hell out there. So I decided I'll pick and choose and see exactly what happens there. I looked at those minutes and I see something happen on that first General Assembly that's still alive here tonight. I say to you tonight, we are passionate about this book. That first General Assembly said that we will give ourselves to the study of this book and we want no doctrine that's not found in this book. Now, if you ask me how to maintain our identity, I tell you this. It is to be rooted and grounded in the Word of the living God. We're going in the last mile. It's not going to be what some smooth prophet tells you. It's not going to be some kind of hanky-panky show. It's not going to be somebody smoothing stuff over on you. It's going to be what saith the Word of God. The devil will call people to life. The devil will heal sick body. But the devil cannot duplicate God's eternal Word. I tell you tonight, we can never veer from the Word of God. That's why we said we believe in the verbal inspiration of the Bible. This church took a stand a long time ago. And I'd like to tell any Johnny come lately, there's not a chapter in this book that's not real. There's not a book in this Bible that's not real. There's not a one word in this Bible that's not real. This is God's infallible, eternal Word. And that's all that's going to keep us in this day. It's our only anchor. As they sing here tonight, the anchor holds what? is that anchor. That anchor is this upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church of God believes that this Bible is the inspired, infallible word of God. We can never leave that. Holy men of old wrote this as they were moved upon by the Holy Ghost according to 2 Peter chapter 121. And he said, for thy word is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing the son of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The devil would like for us to write off this book. The devil would like to get us looking at some kind of something else, some kind of supplement. But I want to tell you, when this world's on fire, when everything else is gone, heaven and earth shall pass away, but God's word shall not pass away. I don't want to leave a church that will deny the word of the living God. Oh, God, that we can never, and we can never deny God's infallible word. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place tonight. I believe I fought the beast of Ephesus to get up here, so somebody's interceding. Somebody's calling on God. I got to tell this church, don't let somebody come and smooth you over in a pulpit. If you can get online tonight and hear what I'm telling you, I'm telling you as, as a general overseer that this church does not tolerate anybody that does not preach the Word of God. He said in the last days in Amos, he said, Behold, the day will come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, and not a famine of bread, nor of water, but for the hearing of the word of God. So many places across this day, this world, all they hear is some kind of funny joke, something that will not touch their soul. But you hear me, when you preach this word, when you preach this word, it will offend. It will offend. You can sit on every bar stool and sing kumbaya till your tongue flaps in your jaw. It'll never do what this word will do when it's preached in its purity, when it's preached in its power. I leave you this. This church can never leave the word of God. (laughs) 
Second thing I want to tell anybody listening across this land, that this church was concerned about souls. That's what it's all about, souls, souls. We're not interested in anything that's getting people saved. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, and the recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them are bruised. He's called us tonight to preach this gospel to the lost and the dying of this world. This church is not about big buildings. This church is not about somebody's ego. This church is not about somebody's reputation. This church is about a hand that will reach in a garbage can and put some mother's son and some mother's daughter up out of sin and tell them there's a cross. The cross, the cross makes the difference. It's a church that preaches the cross. I don't care where you are tonight and what kind of methods you're listening to us about. I tell you again, fresh and anew, this church is concerned about the lost of this world. That's why we weep tonight. We weep for the salvation of mankind. Oh, God, don't let our families go to hell. Oh, God, don't let our children go to hell. Oh, God, don't let the society go to hell. There are five billion people on the face of this earth that does not know Jesus Christ. If you were to line them up one in front of another, it'd circle this globe 25 times around the equator, 25,000 mile long, five times around this world. And what does some churches, or what are they interested in? They're interested in what they look like, sound like, when they should be concerned that every second that we sit here tonight, somebody drops into hell. Somebody said we fill up other churches. I hope we fill up every church in the United States because at the very heart and soul of this church is the desire to win the loss at any cost. We still preach Jesus crucified, that he was buried, that he rose again, that he was born of a virgin, that when you know Jesus Christ, you can be saved. Your life sins can be changed. We still preach regeneration. We still believe in the new birth because old things pass away and behold, all things become new. That's who we are. That's who we are. We can never deny it. We're out for the salvation of the lost. But something else happened on that day. Something else took place that thrills my soul. Not only was there healing, was not was there salvation for the lost, but there was healing for the body. I'm praying to God that he will send a healing revival on this church. We need to be healed emotionally. We need to be healed in our spirits. But we need to see some miracles of healing take place in our church. I've come to this assembly, and there's going to be a time in this service that we're going to ask God to heal the sick people that are here. I hope you've come to this place tonight expecting something because you won't have to leave here like you came in Jesus' name. 2,000 years ago on a hill outside of Calvary, there was a bloody sacrifice nailed to a tree, and every time they beat him out of his side by the risen the stripes of his back, we declare by his stripes we were healed. We were healed. We were healed. It's part of us. Well, we're passionate about the word. We're passionate about the lost. And we're passionate about power. Go right on, brother. You go right ahead. The deadest thing in all the world is a dead Pentecostal church. People sit in churches longing for a move of the Holy Ghost. There's something in the DNA about this church I'm talking about. You'll just put up with so many dead, dry services because you're addicted to the power of God and you'll have to have you a fix. They can call you what you want to, but you read that verse that said, you shall receive power, Acts 1 and 8, after, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the other. I feel his power filling this place right now. It's like a gulf of his power moving in this place right now. 
I'm telling you, it's the Holy Ghost and fire. It's the Holy Ghost and fire. It's the Holy Ghost and fire, and it's keeping us alive. We are Pentecostals because we know in Acts 2 and 4, they were praying, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting, and they were appearing in cloven tongues like as a fire, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. I know that Philip went to Samaria in chapter 8 and preached the Holy Ghost to them. In Acts chapter 9, Paul was baptized in the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 10, Cornelius was filled with the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 19, Ephesus was filled with the Holy Ghost. We are a Pentecostal church. We make no apology for it. We believe when you get the Holy Ghost, you'll speak with other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. study your history. Look at the former rain and look at the latter rain. Something started happening. Lord, help me tonight. Something started happening. I tell you, when I got the Holy Ghost, it took all the fear out of me. Sometimes when I get up, my knees knock and I get worried. But when I get the feeling this holy boldness that I know it's the Holy Ghost, you're not afraid of the devil or anybody else and bring them on. We've stirred him up, brothers. We've stirred him up. Come on out of your holes. Come on out. Because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. It's time to declare whose side are you on. It's the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, he'll lead the church. We are a Pentecostal church. My granddad was a coal miner in Big Stone Gap, Virginia. My grandmother said, Charlie, don't you go down there at that wholeness bunch. It'll get all over you. So help me, he went down with his little Bible. He wanted to press in there and tell them where they were all wrong. He was the president of a big society uptown, and something happened. God slapped him down in the sawdust. He later said it was like his legs were like water. And when they got him out of the floor of that old tent, he was talking in tongues. He milked a Jersey cow and ate strawberries and started seven churches of God and raised eight kids. Hold on, my shy. He was in a commissary one time and a couple of bullies came in. They said, we're going to run you out of town, Charlie King, because you're one of those holy rollers. One of those smart addicts picked up an iron poker he swung and hit my granddad in the head. He said it was like there was a cushion between his head and that iron poker. And all of a sudden, he started speaking in tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. There was a man there in that coal mining camp from Hungary. He walked over and said to those bullies, you don't want to know what he said. He spoke in a language 2,000 miles away from here where I grew up. And he said that the fear of God was on your head. We are here today because of signs and wonders and demonstration. I'm tired of making apology. I'm tired of saying it happened somewhere else. It's the Holy Ghost. He's in this church tonight. And every demon, every devil, hell knows it. The devil's afraid of the church of God. I'm going to tell you the devil's afraid. If this church ever gets alarmed, if this ever church ever gets united, if this ever church, if this church ever gets it together in these last days, he's had it. Lay your hand on somebody beside you right now. I feel a wonderful witness of the Spirit. I feel a witness of the Spirit in this place tonight. And some people question it. They've never seen it. But if you've ever seen him, if you've ever felt him, if you've ever experienced him, the question is settled. We're raising a generation that's never seen the move of the Holy Ghost. I feel it again. I feel it again. No 
weapon formed against you shall prosper. Your weapons are mighty to the tearing down a stronghold. And yea, though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I want to tell you one other thing. I won't be long. Stand if you want to. These folks have been going around the country. They've been saying, you know, the Lord is delaying his coming. Said, know this first, that there shall come in the last days. Scoffers. Scoffers. Scoffers walking after their own lust. Saying, where is the promise of his coming? If there is anything tonight I'm convinced of, I'm convinced that Jesus Christ is coming again. We weep over Pentecost. We weep over salvation and healing. We weep over the book. But we weep knowing that weeping endureth for the night Say it. Weeping endureth for the night. Say it. Weeping endureth for the night. Say it. Oh. Joey! The trumpet's going to sound. The dead in Christ are going to rise. And we're going to be caught up together to meet the Lord in the and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Some people don't want to preach it. Some people don't want to proclaim it. Some people want to hide it. But we believe in the coming of Jesus Christ and we can never forsake that. Don't you rewrite my book. There's too many people that haven't spoken yet. There's too many people in this church that will not give up the Word of God. There's too many people in this church that won't give up the fact of divine healing. There's too many people in this church that won't give up the salvation of the lost. There's too many people in this church that will never turn loose of the Holy Ghost. And there's too many people looking for Him. They're going to have the worst time trying to transcribe this and put it in some little minute somewhere. So whoever writes it up, just put in what you want to put in because I'm not on the schedule tonight. I feel the Holy Ghost wanting to speak to the church of God. Look at it. The darkest hour is just before the dawn. Israel is a nation again. According to Acts to Isaiah 66. Now, if you need to start traveling out, I want you to hold your place for a while. I don't want to be embarrassed, a bunch of people running in out of a church like it's some kind of circus. If you got somewhere else to go, you need to wait just a minute till I get through preaching. I'm preaching the church of God. Now get your seat and sit down till we get through with this thing tonight. You see, Israel, you got somewhere else to go and you want to leave the God, then go, let it be your responsibility. But some people in this place want to realize that Jesus is coming again, that Israel's back in its promised land, that Jerusalem is in the hands of the Gentiles. They know that there's a people movement going on according to Daniel chapter 12. They know that lawlessness runs throughout the land. They know that there's a transfer of wealth throughout the country. They know that something is about to happen because this little group of ragtags that they had to say, they tried to say they're nothing but, there's something more today because there's 650 million of us. And he said in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. There is a revival in Central America. There's a revival in South America. There's a revival in Africa. There's a revival in Europe. There's a revival in Asia. It's a Holy Ghost revival. It's according to the, prophets, uh, the prophecy that in the last days, God would pour out out his spirit upon all flesh. I'm looking for his return. Would you stand with me, please? Oh, please pray with me right now. I know a people 
that are carrying deadly diseases. And they wanted to get back to this General Assembly to let this General Assembly pray the prayer of faith. I got enough oil around here to pray for every cancer patient, everybody that's got heart problems, everybody that has a problem in their life of sickness. I feel that our distinctive is that we believe in divine healing provided for all in the atonement. I'd like about a hundred preachers or more. I don't care if you come from a big church, a little church, or if you just testify on Wednesday night, but you believe that God can heal miraculously. You feel faith in your life tonight. Come right here and stand with me right now, preachers. My God, you're coming. God bless you. Hallelujah! You foul devil. A man pulled up. Oh, oh, there's healing in the house. There's a man that pulled up to his pastor. Pray for my boy. He said he's going to die. Take him home. But he took him down to a little church of God preacher's place. He rolled down the window. And Brother Muncie looked in that back seat and said, You foul devil of tuberculosis, come out of him. That day, Or Roberts sat up in the back of that seat, healed because a church of God preacher laid his hand upon him. My God, I feel healing. I, they're spreading out all right here with you in this place tonight. Keep us a spot right out here. Oh, we got to break this yoke. Jenny, you made it. You made it, Diane. I want all the sick that want to be healed of any disease. I want you to come and stand right here. It's ironic. Right here is the emblem of our church. You're from across this place. They've said you can't be healed. I want you to come and stand right here. You foul spirit of hell. You come, you're sick tonight. Come to this altar tonight. Look at these host of men who've seen healing take place. Oh, Sholobokundana Masataya. They've told you. Oh, Katana Masataya. You know, there's weeping in the house. <laughs> There's weeping in the house. You want to see somebody heal? Come on, Brenda. Come on. If you've got the worst case of anything, come tonight. Don't be afraid. Come tonight. Up in the balcony. If they've told you there's no answer, no cure. My God, I've never seen men are praying and they're crying. It's time to lay hands on them. Come on around. Come on. Come on, preachers. Pray for them. Pray for them. You foul spirit of affliction. You've come on these people. I tell you by the power of God in Jesus. Cancer, you have to go. Heart trouble. You gotta go. You have to go. People are still coming. Make room for them to come down here to be prayed for. I don't care what your affliction is. Jonathan, help us get them in here. Brothers, right there, come on, move them in. 